Um, but we're back with 420 Post Live, and we have a really great show for you today. Uh, we're going to be introducing to my audience, although I'm sure you all have heard of them, Terrapin. Uh, they're going to be talking about what they're doing in Michigan. And then we also have the folks from Gage joining us. Uh, and uh, they're going to be talking about their social equity participants that, that they've just added. And then, of course, the free for all at the end where everybody can uh, talk about whatever it is they want to talk about. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. This is the Cannabis News with Rick Thompson on 420 Post. Let's begin. Well, the big news of the week is, well, us. 420 Post breaks news in multiple areas of cannabis law reform with our interview of the Marijuana Regulatory Agency Director Andrew Brisbo last week. He told us some remarkable things like it's a potential 4 million cannabis users in Michigan, only 6.9 million adults over 21 in the state. The industry could hit 3 billion in sales within three years and curbside service is likely here to stay. And with thousands of video views and several mainstream media outlets picking up our stories, the 420 Post machine is breaking news and firing up the industry like never before. You know, Michigan's cannabis industry is one of the most dynamic in the nation and one of the most successful. And that's due to people like you who support specialty journalism in this field. Thank you to everyone. Well, they're calling it the biggest cannabis company in the world, and they may be right. Afria Cannabis and Tilray have announced a plan to combine their kingdoms into a mega empire that eclipses all other cannabis industry giants. That's according to Bloomberg News. The merger is an all-stock deal and will create an entity valued at more than $4 billion Canadian dollars, which is equivalent to about $3.8 billion American bucks. Their combined assets will create that company with annual revenues of nearly $12 billion Canadian which eclipses uh, uh, 12 million Canadian, which eclipses previous industry leaders like Cureleaf and Canopy Growth. Although Afria will control 62% of the stock of the new entity, they will keep the Tilray name. Now, you want to get involved? You can. The company is traded on NASDAQ, and the Tilray shares were available at $7.87 each as of yesterday's market close. Now, according to Forbes, 2021 is going to be a smoking hot year for the cannabis industry. That's according to a market analysis for BDSA, a Colorado industry watchdog. They say 2020 racked up approximately 18 billion in American cannabis sales. The, quote, mature markets, Cali, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado, they'll continue to see strong growth. But the explosive nature of the industry in Michigan Illinois and Massachusetts will see sales increases which eclipse those older programs. Legalization in Jersey will inspire New York to get in the game and it might help push to modernize the Pennsylvania regulatory framework too. Although the expert predicted no federal law change of significance in 2021, there is a good chance it could happen in 2022. Plus, the industry expects to recruit 3 million Americans into the regulated market next year. They claim recruitment in the adult use cannabis market comes at the rate of about 5, 5 to 10 percent of the population every year of an adult use program. Consumers will be up, but the average price of cannabis, it'll be declining. Forbes reports that in 2020, flower sales are about 40 percent of the total sales in the USA, concentrates 30 percent, pre-roll about 10 percent, and edibles 15 percent. But in 2021, with a return to a more normal non-COVID market, they predict sales of concentrates and edibles outpacing flower sales, which would be interesting. Now, final story. I may be in Michigan, but I'm dressed for an island visit. And why not? Bermuda, that hotbed of international travel, might be the location for our next corporate picnic. According to Marijuana Business Daily, Bermuda's Attorney General and Minister of Legal Affairs, Kathy Simmons, presented the Cannabis Licensing Act 2020 to Bermuda's House of Assembly. Now, this would simultaneously create a medical and recreational cannabis industry in the British Empire. But wait! <laughs> you know, the Brits have gone to great lengths to stifle the British Virgin Islands in their effort to adopt a medical marijuana program. Smells like revolution is in the air. You know, hey, Islanders, just a personal request. Our Boston Tea Party was fun, but don't dump bales of Gorilla Glue number four in the Caribbean Sea, please. That stuff is valuable. Now, here at the Cannabis News, we'll be following this story closely because, you know, research in this industry is more of a pleasure than a pain. I think a field trip is in order. And that'll do it for this edition of the Cannabis News with Rick Thompson on 420 Post. Now, back to you, Mike, and our breaking news. All right. Uh, thanks very much, Rick. As you know, on Facebook, I posted uh, that we need to go to the, some island next Christmas 
because by then, hopefully the pandemic will be under control. We'll all be vaccinated and uh, we can have a party like it's 1999 because, boy, I'm ready to go. I don't know about you. But I'll let you uh, interview uh, your, some guests that you have from Gage. The Gage guests can unmute now. And uh, we have some uh, actually breaking news. Take it away, Rick. Well, Gage, of course, made history here in Michigan by the awarding of a social equity uh, award to Ryan Basar, who has been a federal cannabis prisoner, a personal friend of mine, but also somebody who's been through the system and actually came out smiling. Uh, now, we have understand that Gage is ready to award their second social equity award winner, and I'd like to turn it over to Gage so they can talk about that. Hello, everybody. My name is Heather Carter. I am the communications and marketing manager at Gage. And yes, we are very excited to announce our second social equity uh, award recipient, D Diop Shoemake. Diop is the founder of Kairos Cannabis Research Foundation, and he is also the founder of the Runner's High 5K. So I'm going to let Diop uh, tell you a little bit more about himself, what he has planned to do uh, next year with his uh, entities and uh, what to, what we can expect from Gage afterwards. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, like Heather said, I'm the second social equity recipient. Uh, I'm also the executive director of the Kairos Cannabis Research Foundation. Uh, a little bit about Kairos. Kairos is uh, raising funds and awareness uh, for cannabis research uh, in tandem with the University of Michigan and Dr. Gus Rose near there. Uh, our goal is really just to uh, shed a light on what cannabis can do for all types of people. Uh, really just, you know, trying to uh, get rid of that stigma of what, what cannabis is, um, which also branches into my, our second entity, which is Runner's High 5K. Uh, just like we have like cancer runs and walks, um, and I believe cannabis uh, is a medicine, and I believe that people can galvanize behind it. Uh, so my goal is to have a, a run slash walk where cannabis lovers, runners, uh, people who are support the actual plant uh, can come together and run and raise money um, to go towards, you know, more research and more understanding of what cannabis can do. So, yeah. Diop, uh, you, you talk about researching with Professor Gus Rosani of the University of Michigan. He's in the pharmacology department. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, Gus has a, got a lot of different ideas in his head. To what degree or to what end are you are you trying to pursue research with him in that program? Yeah, so we uh, are we're focusing on hemp and nutritional supplements at the moment. Uh, we're focusing on what they can do for athletes, how they ingest hemp, um, as far as whether it's through different tinctures, whether through it's actual CBD. Um, so that's our first, first area of focus. Um, then we might go into Crohn's disease or Alzheimer's, things like that. So, yeah. and where is your uh, company headquartered at? In what city? Uh, we're in Detroit, Michigan. Fantastic. Now, as far as that 5K walk run, that sounds exciting, especially the walk part. That's me. Uh, <laughs> but but it, is that something that we could possibly launch in 2021, even with a pandemic? Is it possible that we can socially distance our 5K walk? So with the uh, pandemic, uh, it's very it's difficult. Um, there has been there have been runs and 5Ks that are uh, social distance, um, but it's very possible depending on what Governor Whitmire decides as far as uh, people coming together. Uh, you know, I think there is uh, a limit up to 200 people uh, at the moment, um, but you know, and I'm very hopeful uh, for the next year um, to get that off. Outstanding. And, and what uh, what do you anticipate your business will be doing in 2021? Uh, Give us a 12-month a, a outlook into what you plan to do. Yeah, so over the next 12 months, uh, we're looking to do uh, an event each month, uh, whether it's, you know, might be running, it might be boxing, it might be golfing, uh, having different uh, philanthropic events uh, just to raise money. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, something that we can come together. It might be something that's digital. Uh, we'll have an event every month uh, to just raise awareness and, you know, get that word out there. So. I think Rick would be interested in a in a monthly smoking event. I could be wrong on that, but uh, uh, knowing my friend as well as I do, I know uh, Jamie Cooper is with us too. Why don't you unmute real quick, Jamie? And she's with Sensi Connects, and every week uh, she does a big digital networking event. Why don't you kind of describe what you guys do in that area, Jamie? Yeah, so we host a 
Intellectuals networking event every Wednesday night at six o'clock. It's about an hour long. And what we do is we put people one-on-one -on -one into breakout rooms together for them to have a five minute conversation, talk about their businesses, build that relationship, build that trust. And what happens is we've created this community that has turned into a referral network because we want to help each other grow each other's businesses. And so it's all about community and building those relationships. And, and tonight, is our ugly holiday sweater networking oh, yes. event. I was wondering, so, you can sort of glimmering there in, in the video. So, uh, well, yes. and, you know, I did go ahead and oh, decide. Nice. Yeah, I, I was going to wear I mine really, too, but I thought, eh. You know, so. I could bring on the festivity. I love wow. this stuff. So. Yes. So. But yeah, like, you know, it really is. We, we have the cannabis industry has such a tight knit community. And, you know, we want to build community with the patients and those that consume our products. We want to build community with other businesses. I mean, we really need to be supporting each other. And thank you guys, Gage, for everything that you're doing for the community and helping to build it stronger. Hey, and since you have the floor, if you have any questions you'd like to ask them, feel free to do so. Well, yeah, like, so I, I'm very interested in, in learning more about what Gage plans to continue doing with the social equity, you know, moving on and what the plans, are you guys going to continue doing this programs and giving this type of, of needed funding to recipients moving forward? Yeah, um, we've allocated up to a million dollars, uh, uh, we'll close to a million dollars in funds for different, uh, for recipients all throughout Michigan. Uh, we just launched our website uh, this week. It's www.gageusa.com forward slash the letter S and the letter E. And if you can go on there, you can see uh, what you need in order to apply to our grant program, um, and like the checklist, fill out the application, um, and then we have a webinar coming up in January on January 7th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, Eastern time. And then after that, I mean, we really are more so going to be involving ourselves more with the community, um, uh, giving our uh, grants um, over quarterly, that's our plan, but also involving ourselves more with the community as well as creating some community partnerships so we can allow, you know, um, events uh, and give access to resources to people within the areas that have been disproportionately affected by the marijuana prohibition policies, AKA war on drugs, um, and just really uplift those communities. So maybe it's like financial literacy, maybe it's business development, marketing, public relations, whatever it may be. Um, we definitely, we want to be involved in those communities. Our plan is to be involved in those communities and see what it is that we can do to uplift them um, and provide resources in that way um, as well. Heather, let me jump in. Uh, do you, I'm, I'm not sure. Do you guys have a provisioning center in Detroit yet, or do you have plans to do that? We do. We have cookies at this time. Um, uh, I believe we might be planning to open up some more uh, in the Detroit area. I don't want to comment on that because I'm not officially sure, but we do. Um, we have cookies right now. We have our gauge, loc our gauge, uh, our Gage uh, flagship store in Ferndale. And then we have other locations around the state and more to come in 2021. Grand Rapids. Reason, yes, so the reason I bring that up is because part of, if I understand it right, Rick, uh, Detroit, part of their deal is they want to make sure that Detroit people that live in Detroit get a chance to open these provisioning centers or related sort of businesses. Is that, is, do I have that right? Certainly, legacy Detroiters are now defined by the city and given special accommodation and in, in licensing, they're going to split the licenses available to cannabis retailers. Uh, there'll be 75 licenses. Half of them will go to businesses which incorporate legacy Detroiters. Half of them will go probably to existing cannabis industry representatives that are already in Detroit in that market. Okay, that's why I brought that up because I know you're doing the social equity stuff and Detroit's a prime place that needs that, right? So sure we're definitely going to be in detroit um and all the other municipalities that the mra has said has labeled as you know areas that have been disproportionately that's our goal um to get these grants out to provide resources and really just to help uplift these communities um it's something that i care about it's something that the founders really care about and that's why they have decided to like hey we're going to give this amount of money um, I don't know if it'll be more in the future. We'll see. 
but this is where they're starting and they really just want to set the example of other companies in Michigan like this is how you do a proper social equity program in in my opinion um, and that's what we care about. Uh, you've seen the success with Ryan Besor. We're looking forward to the success with Diop and all of our other recipients in the future. And I think I cut you off, Jamie. So you were going to say something. Go ahead and finish your thought. Oh, and I, I wanted to ask Diop, like, what kind of advice would you give to someone who is needing this type of funding to get their concept, their idea off the ground? You know, what was that process like for you? Well, the process was, was actually very personal for me. Uh, I would encourage anyone who's looking to uh, get into cannabis or even uh, find social equity grants, uh, find a social equity partner like Gage, uh, to look inside, look in, uh, look at what you can do, uh, what you can provide. Uh, my thing was uh, mental health. Uh, I was battling depression in 2018 um, and I found a way out by running. Uh, and I combined that with my cultivation experience and uh, just really started getting get the work um, and then reached out and tried to find uh, people who believed in what I was doing. And uh, I found Dr. Gus and I found Gage. So uh, just start there. Just start where you believe uh, you can add a value to the community that you're in. Heather, it took about a year between Ryan Basor's award and Diop's award. Can you explain to me what that year was like searching for social equity applicants, somebody that, that might be, you know, deserving of the Gage Bequithment? Well, really, Rick, what we needed to do was after we awarded Ryan with the um, with our first grant, we realized that we needed to develop the program more and we needed to get um, get some things very concrete about what it is that we're looking for in a recipient, you know. Um, yes, I know the MRA has its basic qualifications, but we want to take it a step further and really understand what the stories were behind the people who were applying for um, the for the grant. For, um, for the grants, you know, some people would just reach out to us, to us and say, hey, I need $50,000 because I want to start a grow. And it's like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure a lot of people want $50,000 to start the grow. But you know, why you, you know, what's your story? What are you going to do? If you bring if you have this business or this organization, how is it going to benefit the community? You know, we're not just going to give out money to you just because you want this grow or you want to just whatever it is that you want to do there has to be some pur purpose there has to be some substance and with that in mind you know we started to def we started to develop the program a bit more we took in mind uh, we took in account like expungement now we know that you know expungement is going to be automatic within the next I think year or two but you know people still need resources I'm on the national expungement um, I'm on national expungement weeks uh, um, group and um, sorry, national team. And um, I've had some insight after, you know, doing uh, clinics with Margot uh, Bruner about what it is that people really need in the community. And I took those experiences and I've, you know, I've brought it to leadership's attention. And I said, hey, you know, as we are building out this program, let's add this as a part of it. And let's add more community resources because, you know, I'm also from Detroit and I know what, um, what people need. You know, I've been in the industry for a few years. I've seen uh, where the lack is. I've seen where I've struggled, uh, what I wish I had. And um, we really just want to make that available for everybody that's, you know, for the communities uh, that we're involved in and, you know, anybody who really, you know, needs it that's trying to thrive in this industry. Well, I'm interested in Diop, but I mean, you're going to do a 5k walk run. When are we going to do a 0k sit lay? Because <laughs> I can win that one. Eat cookies, eat cookies marathon. I think that would be a good one, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's smoke. That's, that's, that's a great idea, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of them. I'm full of them. Yes. All right. Well, since I do uh, that every Saturday. Yes. There you go. We're we're gonna turn back to Jamie, and I want everybody. I want uh, Heather and Deb to stay with us. We're gonna bring in the other guests now, and it's Jamie's guest. So why don't you introduce the folks from Terrapin? And at the end, we'll have a roundtable where we can talk about a variety of subjects. So stand by. All right. Go ahead, Jamie. Take it away. Wonderful. Well, very excited to have Terrapin with us today. We have. Chris Woods and we have Brad Rigoni um, joining us to talk about their plans. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. So, um, so first of all, tell us both of you guys take a little time to tell us a little bit about yourselves, your positions within Terrapin and your backgrounds. 
Okay, yeah. So I'm Chris Woods. I'm the owner, founder, and CEO of Terrapin. We're going on our 12th year in the cannabis business. Self-funded this. I grew up outside of Philadelphia. You know, Brad himself is from Detroit, born and raised. Um, my girlfriend is from Grand Rapids, so it's a nice homecoming for both of them. Um, you know, we started in Colorado uh, in 2009, you know, self-funded. We've remained private throughout all of this, uh, you know, which is a huge accomplishment. But, you know, it's nice to see Michigan, you know, passing their ballot initiative. I work really hard with my friends with uh, at Vicente Cedarburg and the Marijuana Policy Project, who I know is also integral in the Michigan ballot initiative to legalize marijuana, the first state uh, in the United States to legalize recreational marijuana. So, that was exciting. Um, we've since expanded to Pennsylvania. We're the, one of the first grower processors to operate in that medical market there. And then, um, you know, back in the spring with the pandemic, we were the first uh, cultivation facility to be licensed in Grand Rapids. And we're, you know, expanding throughout the state. You know, we're engaged. Thank you so much for having us on your shelf. You know, 50 other uh, dispensaries within the state. So you're really excited to go into the Michigan market. We see a lot of parallels between Colorado and Michigan. Um, and you know, thanks for having us on, Jamie. Brad, do you want to tell us just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Brad Rigoni. I'm the COO. I have been uh, working with Chris for the past three years. Um, Chris and I have known each other for about five or six years previous to that. Um, I've always been uh, very much in awe of what Chris has been able to achieve, and I was thrilled to come on board. Um, as mentioned, yes, I was born in Detroit. Um, I spent my first 10 years of life there. Uh, my family then moved to the Canton area where my entire family still lives um, in Plymouth, Canton. And you know us Michiganders are very proud. Yes, I, there you go. You have the hand, yes. Oh, you got a little dot there. Yeah, very good. dot on my hand. So <laughs> someone says, where are you from? <laughs> Now, did you did you did you draw that on there before the show? Now, or is that tattoo? That is permanent. That is oh. that is there forever, um, and it's been there for many years. Um, so, <laughs> obviously, I'm I'm very proud to um, work with Terrapin. You know, um, we do a lot of nonprofit work. Um, it's it's truly an honor to be back in my home state, as Chris mentioned. Uh, being in Grand Rapids and, and throughout the entire state is incredible. I've been truly enjoying the conversations I've been having with many of our clients, including Gage. Um, I believe that we deal with Mark with Gage and we're, we're proud to be in you know, all four plus um, of your locations. In addition to that, um, I'm personally really happy that we are covering the entire state. As we all know, Michigan is a very large state. Um, and we are from Detroit to the very tip top of the Upper Peninsula in Iron Mountain. Um, we're in a location up there called Rise Up. Um, we've had many great partners such as 315, Jars, Herbology, Elite. Um, and we're continuing to grow and continuing the conversation with all of our partners in the state. And we're looking forward to just having a long lasting relationship and doing great things for all of the communities that we're in. One of the things we had, we had Andrew Brisbo on last week and uh, Rick's been writing great recaps of what he had to talk about but he did break a lot of news and he's expecting us if you include the medical marijuana do about three quarters of a billion dollars this year next year double that and the following year three billion so uh, michigan is really taking off so i think you you've come in uh, grow a golden opportunity as it were so absolutely thank you um so first of all like what tell us a little bit about what terrapin has going on currently in michigan what will the Terrapin brand look like five years from now in Michigan too? Kind of interested in hearing about what you guys have planned for Michigan. Yeah, so we're um, in a 30,000 square foot facility in Grand Rapids and industrial there. Um, you know, we have some uh, projected expansion, but you know, we're really excited to bring the whole portfolio of Terrapin brands, you know, both Terrapin and our concentrate line, which is called Double Bear. Uh, we have a topical line. So you're learning to serve all sectors of the market. Um, you know, it's been a lot of licensing, you know, having to start off medical, you know, then transition into recreational. So we're having, uh, you know, our lab products are hitting the shelves here in the next, you know, four to six weeks or so. So we're really excited about that. Uh, with Terrapin, you know, the flower, obviously, you know, we have a reserve, a reserve line of flower that we sell throughout the country um, and, you know, really replicating you know, what we're doing throughout the entire country, um, you know, here in Michigan, and just kind of slowly ramping that up as we go along. 
Awesome. And uh, what were the similarities in the process of getting up and running compared to like, say, Colorado, where you started, or even Pennsylvania, where the market is a little, a lot tighter? Yeah, so I would say Colorado and Michigan are very similar in the sense that, you know, Michigan has always had a pretty mature medical market, but it didn't really have the regulatory framework that you were talking to Andrew Brisbo that is just sort of rolled out. Um, Colorado initially had, um, you know, provisioning centers, caregiver, collective sort of things without any regulation. And I remember the first uh, time that we ever had to apply for licensing, you know, there was like 2,000 uh, applicants within a matter of a month. So transitioning from that gray market to that regulated market in Colorado and Michigan, I'd say was very similar. You know, transitioning from the caregiver market in Michigan to you know, uh, you know, regulated tax license market, you know, going from medical to recreational, that is very similar. In Pennsylvania, it was pretty tight. You know, there was only you know, 12 initial uh, grower processors, which we were fortunate enough to be one. And you know, the entire market, never really got to a point where it needed to be wrapped back in. So, I mean, I'd say Colorado and Michigan are very similar. Um, you know, Colorado, I think at this point, we're about eight years into recreational, you know, potentially about 12 years, 13 years into medical sales um, and a regulatory framework. And we're still, you know, staying strong in Colorado. Um, you know, it has matured. You have seen you know, some price fluctuations, but yeah, I mean, just the, the quality of cannabis that is being grown in Michigan and the quality of cannabis that is being grown in Colorado and having those organic companies kind of arise up. And, you know, we're very you're proud to kind of be with that group. In Pennsylvania, you see a lot more publicly traded companies that are more corporatized. And, you know, Michigan has got that more parochial, you know, home field, you know, feel to it. And, you know, we're really happy to do business, you know, in the communities that we're operating in, not just as a national platform. Yeah, we don't have very many MSOs in yet. I'm sure that'll change over time. But it's really, like you say, it's more of a, it's a very friendly market now. Everyone's getting along with everyone. There's, there's lots of great centers and grow centers and provisioning centers all starting. Uh, and, you know, they're like four or five per group and things like that. I mean, it's, it's a different kind of feel, I think. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Sorry, a <laughs> little delay. Um, Chris, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, you know, I feel like Colorado did kind of pave that road. And I can't imagine what it was like seven years ago or, or however many years, I guess it was seven years ago when you were helping pave that road in Colorado. And, you know, like what are some of the challenges you saw with being one of the first to start one of these businesses in the entire country? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I do have to say that it was the proudest moment of my life, the day that Amendment 64 passed. You know, we're the largest industry supporter of that. And just what that meant to the, you know, the war on policy, I, I like that as opposed to the war on drugs. And, you know, just the domino that, you know, sort of led to all of this happening. So from the policy standpoint, I mean, I think that's the most important, you know, that this is, you know, a ridiculous policy. Uh, it's disproportionately affecting you know, people of color. And, you know, I mean, that that is the most important. But yeah, we see similarities in Michigan right now, spinning up a regulatory framework, working in, you know, seed to sale tracking software, and, you know, really just dealing with your know, incremental sort of processes. You know, if you look at liquor in Colorado, you're still getting new liquor laws. And you know, every year in Colorado, we're having new changes, new changes, and just getting to that mature market. So as, you know, testing kind of rolls out as, you know, like you have social equity programs rolling out. I mean, you know, those sort of things are, you know, good things that are happening. But I mean, back seven, eight years ago, um, unfortunately, the the legal framework wasn't as uh, conducive to what we're dealing with right now. I mean, I've had to deal with several, you know, colleagues, contemporaries, friends, you know, getting federal enforcement letters, dealing with banking concerns. And I mean, I'm really happy that the industry is maturing in that capacity right now you know, getting, you know, more status quo sort of understanding of what's going on. And though it's not legal, I mean, I think there's a revolutionary moment uh, over the last couple of weeks with the United States representatives uh, voting to, you know, pass the MORE Act. I know that's not necessarily likely to go through, um, 
you know, the United States Senate, but maybe it is with these races down in Georgia. You know, and thank you so much for you know, the work that everyone's been doing with Get Out to Vote stuff. So, I mean, we've spun off the Cannabis Voting Project, and I think the amount of political activism that has occurred within this industry, you know, in the social equity programs, but also in terms of, you know, just uh, policy reform, it's been monumental. So, I mean, I'm really happy that Michigan is kind of hitting its stride, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, further down the road than Colorado was, because to be frank, it was kind of scary, you know, starting this in 2008, 2009, it wasn't as vogue as it is now to be, you know, participating in a, um, a legal cannabis program, and especially the first one. Rick, do you have any questions? Well, of course I do. Uh, the Marijuana Regulatory Agency Director Brisbo just mentioned on Wednesday, talked about the Cannabis Regulators Association. Now, that's a national association made up of individuals who control state programs all across the United States of America. And it's possible that they could help influence some of those things, Chris, you just talked about as being limiting factors in the success of our industry. Do you have a lot of optimism for what they might be able to accomplish as the regulating authority? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, they all speak the same language. And yeah, I remember when we first started in Colorado, they had the first regulatory agency, which is the Marijuana Enforcement Division in Colorado. And they would bring, we've hosted tours from Wyoming, Indiana. And, you know, when you have your know, regulators and, you know, law enforcement talking to law enforcement, they understand that the boogeyman is not necessarily coming out. And I mean, I, I think you know, the more and more we're bringing this into a mainstream, you're know, working with government. And I, I did read, I think it was an interview, maybe it was your outfit with Brisbo. Someone was asking, he's like, hey, have you smoked cannabis in the last however many months? And he said, no. It's like, have you ever done it before? He's like, no, but you know, I, I regulate this. This is a legal business in our state. I mean, and we've had to deal with it with our governor, first go governor in Colorado that was overseeing the program, John Hickenlooper. He's like, I didn't vote for this. But, you know, my state has and I'm working on behalf of my state. So, I mean, I think the, you know, the discussions across, you know, states with regulators um, that have not yet adopted this, they see that this is kind of coming down the pipe. And especially, unfortunately, with the uh, your budget shortfalls that other states are forcing, you know, facing with the pandemic, they are looking for, you know, new revenue streams without taxing, um, you know, their states. And you know, a lot of these states that we're seeing that are left on the board are, you know, more red states. And, you know, they don't want to raise their taxes, but they want to create revenue. And being able to have discussions with other members of law enforcement to understand that the world's not going to come to an end, I think is very helpful. Yeah. Tuning the dialogue surrounding cannabis law reform is important. As we discard some of those tropes from the drug war, you know, uh, cannabis dispensaries bring crime to the community. Uh, your children are going to drop out of school and, and you know, live in a van. And, and you know, they all move to Colorado, though. So that's yeah, that's it. You know. us. Uh, but the fact is, we're looking now at, at a new dialogue. And it's, it's because of the success of some of the more mature markets we talked about, the Pacific Coast states. Colorado, uh, including Michigan. Uh, as far as a multi-state operator goes, not all state programs are created equal. Where would you assign Michigan's program as far as best in the nation, one of the best in the nation? Certainly very convenient for personal freedoms and, and our unrestricted areas. Yeah, I, I think it's fair. It's the most similar to Colorado in terms of what I think has been a model for the rest of the country. You know, it's a free market. You know, it's not restricting licenses to, um, you know, just large multi-state operators. I think it's allowing for community involvement. It's taking a lot of good things, you know, from uh, more restrictive markets in terms of economic development. You know, we're expanding in Missouri right now, and I could tell you in terms of bringing crime to areas, you know, some of the remodeling that we've done in you know, economically distressed zip codes there, you know, we're providing more security, economic vitality, you know, and you know, providing jobs for the community, and you know, it's actually a lot safer. So I, I love that Michigan is going down that road. Um, I mean, I'm partial to Colorado. You know, it's our home, it's our headquarters, but yeah, you know, I, I feel like Michigan is a sister state to Colorado you know, in this process, you know, through this, you know, long windy road of legalization. And, you know, we're, we're thrilled to be here right now. So I, I put it at second to Colorado. Okay. All <laughs> right. We'll accept that. <laughs> the fact is in 2008, when the drafters of the medical law uh, created it, 
Colorado was the basis upon which they they built. Took a little from Cali, you know, but essentially what they tried to do is duplicate the success that we saw. And that's what when we crafted the law in in 2018 for the legalization program, we tried to take best practices from other states and incorporate that into our language as well. Can you talk a little bit about some of the the uh, uh, social equity that you're doing with your own company? I know that uh, we had a little bit of a discussion prior to coming on air about some of the exciting things you're doing. Yeah, so I mean, one of the goals of Terrapin is serving the communities that we operate in. And your know, communities are you know, obviously composed of you know, different members. In Pennsylvania, you know, we're in a disproportionate uh, uh, area with uh, service disabled veterans. So, you know, we worked, you know, to have veteran owned uh, transport company and we have, you know, about, you know, I think 30, 40 service disabled veterans working, you know, in central Pennsylvania. And like, that's, that's a pretty hard up area that we were able to spin off, uh, you know, uh, a national, you know, security and transport company, you know, comprised of service disabled veterans formed by service disabled veterans. Uh, we work with the color of cannabis in Colorado and also in Michigan. You know, we held a job fair back in the spring. You know, we we're able to have you know 25 percent of you know, our workforce come from diversity population. You know, and we're also, in addition to giving money to these programs, you know, providing resources because it's not just money, as the people at Gage are saying. You know, it's the resources and the education to really spin these programs up yourself. You know, my girlfriend was on a program last weekend with several members of our company where they're giving educational uh, platforms and giving people the tools and resources. You're not just giving someone a fish, you're teaching them to fish and you know, really truly succeed within the community. So you know, every community is different. You know, we try to be cognizant of that, but you know, as social equity continues uh, to be an issue in Michigan and you know, throughout the country, you know, we're trying to you know, pinpoint what are the specific needs of the community. And we're really happy to do that in Michigan and Grand Rapids. Okay, uh, Jamie, before we go into the round table, are there any follow-up questions you want to ask Chris or uh, Brad? No, I think we can go ahead and go into the round table. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, you know, we've been talking about social equity programs and you're, both of the companies are involved in that. Why don't we talk a little bit more about that, how those can be improved, built upon, that sort of thing. What are your ideas on that? Anybody? What are our ideas on how uh, to make how it better, improve it, to uh, reach more people, anything along those lines? I mean, it's a brand new program, so all, everything can be improved. How would you improve it? I think that I think by really just knowing the communities that you're in, like really just knowing what it is that they need, what they're lacking. Um, so then that you can be able to shape your program that way as well. I know. Um, and don't quote me on this, but I believe when um, when a company gets their license here in Michigan, you know they have to um, allocate um, some resources towards social equity. But it's not very clear on what social equity is. So maybe Michigan should, because I mean they could go what donate to uh, an animal shelter. But like we all know what the basis of social equity really is, and that's really just you know giving fair opportunities for people from those communities that have been disproportionately affected by the war on uh, sorry by the war on drugs. So I think um, improving if we want to improve it, I think we need to make that very clear when these companies get their licenses on what social equity is and how to actually go about um, go about. Uh, creating a program uh, in within their company, um, adding that to their business model. And then with that, really knowing what it is um, that their community needs, like really being uh, involved um, in there as well. Knowing the people, talking to the people, because these are the people that are buying your products at the same time too. You know, these are the people that you want to continue to shop with you, you know, so why not take that time to know them? And that's what we're planning to do. Like, yeah, I'm saying not like, but that's what we're planning to do in 2021. Chris, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so I, I think exactly what Gage is saying. Yeah, I mean, really just serving the community that you're operating in. In Grand Rapids, you know, obviously social equity is important, but you know, there's struggling nonprofits. We work with a you know a group called Kids Food Basket. They're providing uh, lunches to low-income families, and yeah, I and mean, this is something that is. Yeah, it's not an issue of color. It is an issue of color, but it's also an issue of just like economic disparity. 
that exists within the community. I mean, you have people that have lost their jobs, you know, so being able to, you know, serve the people that have, you know, lost their jobs that aren't as privileged and then working there. You know, we work with a group called Moms Bloom that deals with new moms and the counseling services. You know, we have a, you know, a veteran, uh, you know, counseling group and, you know, really just doing it for the right reasons. We do a ton of get out to vote work and, you know, just, you know, identifying what that is. And unfortunately, I think the hard thing from a policy standpoint is what Gage is saying too, is like, how do you enforce that in your business model? If you just say that this is a requirement that you do it, you're really not doing it for the right reasons. You're doing it to check the box. I mean, Terrapin, I think this year has given over $600,000 to 20 nonprofits throughout the country. And, you know, we're really, you know, wanting to you know, engage in our communities because it's not just about the money, it's you know, about bettering the communities that you serve and really you know, working with the community stakeholders. So, I mean, I think there needs to continue to be a stakeholders group you know, in every market. And it's not based on a state, it's best based on the local government, kind of what you're seeing in Detroit. If Detroit's needs are different than that of Grand Rapids needs and really just targeting sort of that local control and you know, working with those local markets and having that flexibility. And in terms of forcing people that don't want to do the right thing to do the right thing, I mean, that's a $64,000 question in terms of how you make this right. So, I mean, I mean I'd, I'd love to talk to some people that are smarter than me, but all I could do in the interim is do what we think is best to serve our community. Well, Diop, you actually are in the program. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I know it's you're, you're new and all that, but I mean, uh, as it's gone so far, uh, do you see where areas where it could be improved, perhaps? Um, I would think I'll just piggyback on uh, what uh, Kevin is saying. Uh, I really believe that connecting with people who are in the community and actually doing the work, um, giving them the resources, giving them access to networks, um, giving them the uh, the power to, and actually the confidence to keep doing what they need to do for the community and backing them. Um, I think that's the, that is the crux and the key to all of this. Um, you know, social equity is just, you know, it's like we've been saying, it's more than just giving money, more than just um, slapping a name on something. It's actually connecting and getting down with the people um, that are, that have really been affected by the war on drugs. So um, I think, you know, I've, it being in this in this social equity program, um, it's given me, uh, you know, access. It also gives me funding, but uh, it gives me the, the ability to, uh, to connect with people that uh, that I know, that I've been, you know, I've uh, been around you know, all my life. So. Okay. Let's, let's not discount the ability to write a check, though. I'm, I'm part of the Redemption Foundation, as I mentioned before, and we've launched, along with Last Prisoner Project and the Cannabis Caucus, who I'm in leadership of, and, uh, and also uh, Detroit Rising, we've launched the Michigan Cannabis Prisoner Relief Project, trying to pop people out of jail. Uh, Michael Thompson is perhaps, now that Richard DeLisi in Florida has been released, Michael Thompson, we believe, is the longest serving cannabis prisoner left in the United States of America. And we're working hard to do that, too. So from a social equity perspective, you're absolutely right, Heather, there's not a whole lot of direction. And oftentimes people can try to satisfy the social equity requirement by doing things that don't really relate to social equity whatsoever. But I think the generosity and the opportunity to create goodwill with the community by occasionally writing a check or two, that really exists. And for larger companies like yourselves, that's an opportunity to really make a difference in the lives of people that were disaffected by the, the war on drugs. Sure. And then I think also with us, we when we do when we form these community partnerships, you know, we're it's not just us just trying to come into these community and say, hey, trust us. It's more so like, who are your leaders? Let's connect with them. Let's talk to them. What do you need? OK, and and we paying, you know, not well, necessarily us paying us, but like we are creating these opportunities. Maybe it's a workshop or it's a, um, uh, maybe and it's an event. Um, obviously, we have to be very careful with what we do as we can't do anything with like kids or anything like that. But, you know, what is it that they really need? And knowing those partners, knowing those organizers, um, that's I feel like that is really going to be the key into making this community um, partnership very successful when it comes to um, having a successful social equity program. And not to beat a theme, but last week when we talked to Director Burisbo, he talked about the Cannabis Regulators Association, the national organization we discussed earlier, that the primary focus they'd been discussing was social equity programs and how to make that work within their individual states. It's very exciting that they're not talking about how to maximize revenue or how to, to 
properly license people, they're really talking about how to create opportunity for mm -hmm. people who were denied opportunity for falsehoods based on lies for decades, for generations. Yeah. So that's fascinating. Yeah, hats off to Brisbane for that. I went to the NCIA uh, event this summer and he was the lead speaker. And that was one thing that he was really, really adamant about. Like he was really trying to get all the new licensee holders on board with that. So hats off to him. I'm really, um, I really admire the work that he's doing. I'm looking forward to what he's going to be doing for Michigan in the future, for sure. We have about 10 minutes left. Or is there any other hot topic that you all want to bring up and talk about? Uh, we could talk about the new Biden administration and what you expect from them, perhaps, or any other topic. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about communities. Okay, you know, go ahead. Brisbo last week said that there are only 85 municipalities that have opted in in mm. Michigan. So we have a lot of work to do. You know, there's a lot of work to still be done. And I, I wanted to ask both Terrapin and K Gage, like, what can we do as an industry and as a community to open up the eyes of some of these elected officials that are making these decisions and still stuck in that that negative propaganda and, and drinking that Kool-Aid, you know, how do we get them to start opening up and see the opportunities that we are businesses that want to give back to the community? We are an industry that wants to make a big impact on our communities. I think, honestly, I think that we just need to continue to be great leaders. Um, if you're a great leader, people will follow. Um, so being a leader in this industry, uh, helping the communities, actually showing the proof, show, you know, showing them what it is that we're doing and how we are making changes, um, uh, great changes uh, by the work that we, do, that we do. And education, like people, they don't like things that they don't know about. So we have to continue to educate. We have to continue to be great leaders and to um, show them like, hey, just because we smoke, we're not lazy, we're not stupid, we're not gonna be unmotivated or unsuccessful. You know, we have goals, we have things that we have contributions that we want to make to the world, you know, at large. So I think leadership and education for sure are they're gonna be the things that open up their eyes. Free Christmas yeah, and turkeys help too. Free Christmas turkeys help too. You know, we, we talk a little bit about that, but I mean, every time you step out of your, your little box and help someone beyond that and get a little public attention for it, we advance the, the goals of the entire industry. So thanks to both of your companies for the things you do. Chris, I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you when you were about to speak. No, I was just seconding what Gage was saying uh, in terms of community education. I mean, our location in uh, Pennsylvania is in the, the heart of central Pennsylvania. And never in a million years would I think that you would have you know, the operation that we had there. Um, you know, it's very conservative, you know, very much rust belt, dried up manufacturing. But, you know, at that point, we're at this point, we're providing about 100 jobs to the community. You know, a bunch of revenue and like you said never discount the the value of writing a check so as communities you know start facing budget shortfalls and you do exude that leadership that leadership and you know you know basically debunking any sort of myth that you know like there's crime that's going to happen there i mean you'll see communities gradually come online we're still seeing dry counties dry cities come online in colorado you get that quick initial hit and then, you know, as people start to see, it's like, okay, you know, we could, uh, you know, cut, you know, funding for, you know, a fire department, or we could legalize marijuana. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy decision at that point. So, I mean, you know, people have their views are stuck in them, but I think, you know, being good leaders, as Gage is saying, you know, providing those jobs, your know, Christmas turkeys, you know, giving back to the community, it's kind of the entire package. So thanks we for having us on. I appreciate it. We have sort of the, uh, the the central Pennsylvania equivalent in Michigan in a city called Kalkaska, which I know Rick is most familiar with. A very, mm -hmm. my mother's from northern Michigan, very conservative town. It's now like Cannabis Central in Kalkaska, right, Rick? It is. They've, they've adopted an industrial park that's devoted specifically to the cannabis industry. They have processors, they have cultivators, they have retail establishments, and they may actually pop open the very first a social lounge in the state in 2021 uh, uh, if if they get their way. 
So it's all very exciting. And that's, again, part of the Redemption Foundation and what Ryan's done. And that was empowered by Heather and her organization. So again, thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you. And we're looking forward to be a part of more. So just keep it coming in. Let us know what you got going on. Well, the sky's the limit for us in Michigan. No question. A couple of minutes left before we go into our shameless plug. And I'll explain that to both Chris and Heather when we get there. So we got about five minutes more. What, what topic would y'all like to talk about now? Like in Biden administration, I still want to come back to that. Uh, obviously, the more act passed the House, but it's lame duck. It's not going to go anywhere when this on December 31st, that Congress goes away and we're back to square one. And again, we don't know what's going to happen in Georgia on the 5th. Uh, if those two Democrat senators get elected, then Kamala Harris is going to be the tiebreaker. And then you take over the Senate. I don't have a crystal ball, but I mean, assuming that it's still kind of a long shot in Georgia. So, but what the heck? I mean, what can Biden do even if he doesn't have control of the Senate? Well, I mean, I, I think I would shift the discussion in terms of what the results are of the most recent election. And if you look at the ballot initiatives um, that were on, I mean, you see Mississippi passing 70% medical marijuana. You see South Dakota with a governor that was vehemently opposed to it, passing over 60% and 53%. Um, you know, recreational. You see Montana coming on the ballot. You see New Jersey, um, you know, passing about 70%. You know, uh, Arizona at 60%. And all of these ballot initiatives are outperforming any Democrat or Republican candidate that is on the ballot. So we say, you know, marijuana is not more popular than Democrats, Republicans. It's more popular than ice cream. It's more popular than all of them. And yeah, I mean, in terms of what your know, next elections are going to be, I don't care if you have a Democratic Congress or a Republican Congress. I mean, you know, people are going to have to get on board with this and understand with the voting rights and the voting outreach that this industry has, you know, expanded. You know, we we spun off the Cannabis Voter Project, you know, to inform cannabis, uh, you know, inspired voters to go out to the ballot. And you know, we hit 200,000 people in Arizona with a text message. You had to get people out to the ballot. And we see that you know, Arizona only you know, swung by about 11,000 votes. So cannabis does have real power. And I don't care who's in the White House, who's in the Congress, and who's in the Senate. I mean, at some point, people need to understand that marijuana is more popular than ice cream, and they need to get behind this. So the Green Party, as it were. Exactly. <laughs> Okay. That might, be, that might be a name that's already taken. I'm just. Oh, yeah, just... yeah. Different, different <laughs> Green Party, right? Yes. <laughs> the pot party. <laughs> okay. We like to refer to it as can the cannabis party. Yes, the cannabis party. PCP, yeah. please. Right. Yes. Yeah, but, I, I, it has a ring to it, doesn't it? But it, in reality, though, I mean, we talk about it doesn't matter who sits in the in the office of the president, but it really actually does. Because when we talk about things moving in Congress, we've seen Mitch McConnell be an obstruction. And prior to him, uh, you know, Mr. Sessions in the House of Representatives, Pete Sessions, was the big stopper there, too. A single individual properly placed can stymie cannabis law reform throughout the entire United States of America on a federal level. So in instituting change on a statewide level might be the only way that we get to, to, to engage freedoms across the entire United States. At least that's been the, the model that we've worked with so far. And I mean, we're going to continue to push that regardless of whether the feds come along or whether they want to still try and drag the chain. Okay. Uh, we're going to go... Oh, oh Mike, really quick. I would like to propose a challenge for all of our listeners and everybody oh, here, you like know, but especially our listeners, yes. is in 2021, we have an opportunity to make a huge impact and to make some big, big changes in policy. But what everyone needs to do is to build those relationships with their state legislators, with their federal legislators, their congressmen and women, and build that relationship. And just every time that they are, are you know, near you with their open office hours or give them calls, you know, like it's time for us to build these relationships and help them understand cannabis at the level that we understand it. Use that knowledge to educate these people that are making these decisions for us. We need this change. All right. That's a good point to end on. And I'm going to turn it around and let you start the shameless plug, old spangly one there. And uh, let me explain real quick to Heather and Chris. This is where you get to talk about 
your project, what you're going on, you know, your, your pitch to our audience. And we're actually, we had 4,000 people watch the last show with Andrew Brisbo. So it's building audience. So uh, when we get, I'll, I'll, I'll name you off as we go along, you talk about whatever you want to talk about, then we'll end the show. But Miss Spangley, you're up. So. <laughs> well, I will be quick. So we have our Cincy Connects, our B2B networking and, and referral organization. We have our weekly events on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Go to cincyconnects.com, register for tonight's event. I will also put a link in the chat for everyone to register there as well. Um, and then we have Cincy Magazine. Go to cincymag.com forward slash Michigan check out our latest edition. We have the holiday gift guide, um, lots of great content in the magazine. And then we have three participating locations for our holiday grab bags. Um, there's Redbud Roots in Muskegon. We have Meds Cafe in Lowell. And then we also have Bloom City Club in Ann Arbor. Stop by one of those, grab one of those bags. There's 160 bags at each of those stores. We have partners like Terrapin that get, donated a pre-roll in there. We also have Narvona that did that as well. Noble Road Cookies, a couple of CBD products. Really great get. So go get them. The distribution of those bags starts on Monday. Ho, 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 huh? Ho, All ho, right. ho. I like it. Yes, okay. And again, watch Jamie. Uh, she has a very large group of folks that join you at 6 o'clock for your Sensi Connects event, and it's open to anybody that wants to join. And I have been on the show. In fact, I'll try to get on the show tonight. Uh, great networking. You meet people that you wouldn't meet otherwise. Heck of a deal. We have a ton of registrations already. I'm expecting tonight's event to be a big event. So okay. definitely Okay, you got to wear that outfit, though, right? Or oh, that's right. It's the, it's the ugly like, sweater you know, thing you got going. If okay. you come without the ugly sweater, I won't judge you, but I might judge you if you don't come. Okay, got it. Just saying. Okay, let's <laughs> uh, let's move on to Heather. She can talk about whatever she wants about Gage. What what would you like to say to our audience? Um, I would like the audience to know that our social equity website is now live. You can go on there and see what our uh, application criteria is, as well as apply for our grant program. We're giving up to $50,000 in funding as well as public relations and marketing services. Um, you can go to gageusa.com forward slash SE, social, social equity. Um, and then also we have a webinar on January on Thursday, January 7th at 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. You can go on and you can register for that at our social equity website as well please be sure to follow us on instagram at gauge cannabis and on twitter gauge cannabis and facebook as well cool chris you're up oh thanks yeah i'm not used to the shameless plug but um yeah so terrapin you know we're privately owned company you're thrilled to be doing business in uh grand rapids michigan uh you know it's you know pleasure and you know we'll be having a new concentrate line hitting the market here you know for those of you that haven't tried our Terrapins, you know, they're five gram packs of pre-rolls. You know, they're very COVID friendly. Uh, what do they say? You know, bogarting is very popular within the uh, the pandemic. It's so, the only uh, way to go, in fact. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, for those of the, uh, you looking for, you know, COVID safe sort of experience, that's great. So, I mean, Brad, do you have anything that you'd like to add before we split? Yeah, just to piggyback on that, uh, Michigan, we were really proud of Michigan to launch those pre-rolls. It's the first state outside of our home state um, that we were able to, to do those. So, and it was in, in partnership with the, the idea of COVID and being safe. But yeah, no, I'm just, again, extremely proud to be back in my home state, extremely proud to be from literally Detroit to the tip of the Upper Peninsula. Um, we look forward to having more conversations like this. I really appreciate um, the opportunity to be on this it's it's been a pleasure and uh yeah look at your uh, local dispensary um and ask for terrapin all right diop i'm going to give you a chance to talk about all your stuff that you're doing and you had a long list so take it away uh if you guys are interested uh please go and visit www.kairoscannabisfoundation.com uh there you can donate and find out what more we're doing over the next uh next year uh, if you want to donate for cannabis this research. Uh, also, if you are in athletics, uh, you believe in CBD and what it can do for athletes or people with uh, illnesses or injuries, uh, you can visit runhigh5k.com. You can donate there as well. Uh, we'll be having events every month over the next year, uh, different philanthropic initiatives. Uh, it's not all athletics. 
Uh, so just continue to follow us there. And um, on those websites, you can follow uh, our Instagram and social media links. So uh, stay tuned. Okay. And Sir Richard? Well, I'm training for that 0K. Uh, that's, my, that's my goal. <laughs> Frankly, uh, since this is a shameless plug, I, I'm, I'm the leadership of Michigan Normal, the Cannabis Caucus of the Democratic Party. Uh, I'm on the Redemption Foundation. We do I do three different podcasts in the cannabis sphere each week, including Jazz Cabbage Cafe, which is a, a long running political podcast that we do every Tuesday from four to six on Facebook. Um, please support the effort to free Rudy Gamo, free uh, Michael Thompson, and support the Cannabis Prisoner Release Project that I'm I'm part of as well. Okay, and I'm Mike Brennan. I'm the well, sort of the I do a lot of things. I'm the engineer of the show, the producer of the show. I'm also the editor of Michigan Marijuana Report and Michigan Technology News. And in my spare time, I sleep once in a while. But uh, so I want to thank you all for being on the show today and all of our audience out there. Now we are going to take a little break next week on the 23rd. I haven't seen my family in a year because of the pandemic. So I'm going to quietly slip away to Grand Rapids and see my sister and her kids. Uh, we'll be back on December 30th. I want to do a year-end show, so I'm just letting Jamie and Rick know, think about what we can do for a year-end show on the 30th, uh, and then we'll have you all back. And, of course, uh, we'll share all that information in our Michigan Marijuana Report newsletter, which goes out on Thursday. If you don't subscribe, you can do so quite easily by going to mimarijuanareport.com. And since